First of all, uh, can you tell us in a few words what do you do in physics and what's your field of expertise? Sure. Um, I don't have an absolutely specific field. Uh, I've always done um, whatever was the most interesting problem that I could uh, contribute to at any given time. So I've worked on uh, uh, particle accelerators. I've searched for magnetic monopoles in the Gran Sasso. I'm looking f now for gravitational waves, which is also very different. Uh, so whatever is the most interesting contemporary problem that I can actually do something. So I, I like physics, and so it's not very specific. Some people like to do something and get deeper and deeper and deeper. And, um, I like to do a lot of things. So maybe referring to the most recent work that you have done, as you said, was about gravitational waves. So maybe you can tell us about them, like what they are. Yeah. So Albert Einstein made a new theory of, we all learned gravity from Newton. The apple falls out of the tree or we jump up and the earth pulls us down. But we never, as a kid, probably you, I never asked the question of how did the earth pull me down? Or what made the apple fall? So Newton had this um, phenomenological formula with the, uh, the pull dependent on the product of the two masses, the earth and the apple. And the inversely is the square of the distance away, but there's nothing in the theory that explained why. Uh, that theory was fantastically successful, however, for 250 years. And then Einstein came along. And Einstein uh, made a totally different theory of gravity. There's nothing pulling you down. Instead, in Einstein's theory, any massive object uh, distorts space and time around it in such a way that it basically has uh, the equivalent of uh, a hole. Uh, the gravity gets pulled away, and so you are like falling downhill when the apple falls. And so it's a different theory, but why do we need a different theory of gravity? I mean, it, we had a good one that explained everything for 250 years, except one problem, which was probably not very serious, and that was the orbit of Mercury around the sun. Uh, and uh, Einstein's theory solved that problem. So it's hard to accept it from that. But it predicted two other things. The first was what made him famous. In 1919, uh, he predicted from the theory that light, it doesn't matter because we don't have something pulling, it doesn't matter whether we have light going past an object or a massive object going past, they'll do the same thing. They'll follow the curvature of space and time. So he predicted that if a star goes behind the sun and the sun turns black, a full eclipse, that the light will bend and you'll see it even though it went behind the sun and exactly how much it would bend. He calculated and that was observed in 1920 and then people took general relativity very seriously. But it's very difficult theory. So it made one more prediction, and that prediction was that uh, there would be the equivalent of what we have in electricity and magnetism that we're all familiar with, electromagnetic waves, radio waves, microwaves. And <coughs> that he came to because the equations of general relativity, if you form them just the right way, have the same kind of equations that we have for electromagnetic waves, almost the same. And so he predicted uh, gravitational waves. Then uh, the th general relativity is a very difficult theory because it uses all of space and time together. And it's hard to form prob uh, uh, mathematics that allows you to cover all of space and time uh, together. And so depending on how you do it, you get, tend to get what we call singularities, infinities in the calculations. And so even Einstein, 20 years after he predicted gravitational waves, got concerned that maybe they don't exist. And he wrote a paper in the 1930s. So the, and the other theorists didn't all accept it. It wasn't until about 1960 that uh, theorists came together in a meeting in, in uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and they uh, uh, decided that gravitational waves exist for two, because of two uh, presentations. One, by a theorist who 
presented very systematically the formulas without these singularities that exist so theoretically. The second was a conjecture by Richard Feynman that if gravitational waves are real, they have to be able to transfer energy somehow. So he made a Gedanken experiment, that is a, an experiment where you could test it on paper. That is a ring that you surround with something that can pick up the energy and it, when it gets distorted, it's no longer circular. So it pushes pressure and you pick up the pressure and uh, that people were convinced then you could transfer energy, therefore, and the formulas were right. So then it became an experimental problem. But the experiments weren't very good that were done. They weren't very well conceived. They weren't very good until uh, 25 years ago when we decided that the right way to do it was to use uh, a, a kind of detector that would have to be refined but had the right features and that was an, what we call an interferometer. And it measures the difference between two lengths. So if a circle doesn't become perfectly a circle, then you can tell the difference between the fact that it got a little fatter or squashed. And that is what we do in an interferometer. We've spent 20 years developing the technology, and uh, then we got lucky. So we saw gravitational waves. Apart from confirming Einstein's theory of gravitation, um, what are the other aspects of the universe that gravitational waves can tell us it's about? It's fantastic, because we've, we started astronomy with Galileo in 1600s. And he looked through the first telescope, and that was the beginning of gravity. We ascent, the beginning of astronomy. Everything, and we, we essentially are at that stage. We've made the first look. He looked the first time through telescopes and saw the planets. So in three or 400 years in astronomy, we've learned how to have much more sensitive instruments, to have instruments that didn't just look at the visible light, but looks at, look at longer wavelengths or shorter wavelengths. And it's the combination of all that that's made astronomy so rich in understanding the universe. But astronomy is based completely on electromagnetic uh, interactions of one kind or another. So it has to give off light or electromagnetic waves somehow. If the interactions don't, there won't be any. So what we see in the universe is only 4% of what's out there. We label the rest dark matter, but we don't see anything that isn't electromagnetic and radiation. And a lot of things that are electromagnetic, we don't understand very well. Now f we have, although we're just beginning, a completely different way to look at the universe for the first time. And that's with, and gravity's all over the place in the universe. The objects pull on each other and so forth. And now for the first time, we can start to look at the universe with a totally different, um, a totally different physical phenomenon, anything where gravity is involved instead of electromagnetism. Sometimes both will be involved, and if we see something with gravity and it's seen with electromagnetism, the combination can give us uh, information. A third possible way to see the, the universe in a different way is with a particle, and that particle's a neutrino. So in the end, these three probes will be the way many years in the future that we'll understand things. Neutrinos are limited because it's only a particular kind of interaction that gives neutrinos, but they're the third part of this. So it's very exciting to dream or think about what we might see with gravity, even if we don't have the instruments today to do it.